Hi Kenny, great to see you today. How are you doing? Great, thanks. Great, thanks. And yourself? All good. So I'm excited about today because you are here to talk to us about the, the, the chunky, sexy finance that sometimes feels a little out of reach for some of our new investors or listeners here. Um, but if you could just start us off by telling us a little bit about your background and how you got to where you're at right now in your career. Right. So, well, I'm a quantity surveyor by trade. Um, so started off I don't know, kind of fell into it, I suppose. Um, university back in the early noughties, uh, same as now, there was a huge shortage in construction industry. And, um, you know, people would come to careers fairs and say, QS in great career. And I said, OK, give it a go. Um, so I did that at university uh, and then worked in it. So I worked on construction sites for seven years, which was great. Um, I worked with McAlpine, so did big projects. It was good grassroots business. Um, and then I suppose I, I moved on from there because I was all over the place. I was in Aberdeen a couple of years, Glasgow a few years. So, you know, it's like looking to start a family, settle down. Um, I decided to go and try consultancy. So I moved in with uh, Gardner and Theobald in their Edinburgh office, which was phenomenal. It was great. Um, I was in there for five years and uh, got chartered while I was in there. I chartered QS, uh, did a little bit of project management. And then from there, I got an opportunity to try client side and um, being development manager. So that was kind of all around going in, site selections, building teams, delivering a project from inception to completion. And then, yeah, it, it was going good uh, again, four and a half. And as things happen, um, I was several pints deep with my good friend who owns Bradalbin Finance. And uh, he said, listen, what's, you know, what are you going to be doing? Do you fancy having a go? at finance, at the finance side of it, um, because, you know, the view in Bradalbin was there was a little bit of a gap in the market for someone that comes in and looks specifically at development finance. So the seed was planted and it didn't take me long to make the decision. And uh, and here I am, I'm coming in, kind of using my background to, to help people get development finance. Wow, that's quite a route, isn't it, into finance, isn't it, brokerage? Quite a route that's a bit different, but great foresight to the the, the owner of Bredelbin uh, Finance. So you're in as the niche specialist, if you like, um, in um, development finance. Just as an overview, how are you finding the market at the moment? Here we are, interest rates creeping up, people getting yeah. a little bit twitchy, maybe lenders getting twitchy, investors getting twitchy. W what are you seeing uh, from your side? I mean, well, there's no sugar coating it. We're pretty tough. You know, I was looking at the Royal Institution Charter Surveyors, you know, all their projections and reports are, are great reading. And, you know, you look at the graphs, we're in a trough that is only matched really by 2008 and 2020 going into COVID. So it, it is tough, but strangely, there's a lot of activity. You know, people aren't grinding to a halt. Lenders are still lending money. But it's other things like there's a real lack of stock out there. There's um, a lack of properties, a lack of development sites. You know, construction costs have been in the rise and are still going up, you know, whereas values are are sort of staying. But all that means is that profit margins are being squeezed, which means a lot of developments in particular, they're not quite viable. And I suppose a lot the way a lot of things work is that if they already own a site or it's sitting in the market, people say, let's just leave it six months, let's leave it a year and see see if costs change, costs come down, which a lot of people are hoping. So it's slow out there, without a doubt, for all those reasons, it's definitely slow. But, you know, Robert Alban, we're really flexible. We look at all sides of the market. So we're still doing a lot with business owners, a lot of their own developments. A lot of people are, have maybe been planning and designing small housing projects. They're still going ahead. And as long as there's still profitability in them, they're still going. So we're we are still really busy. And a lot of the bigger projects, they're still getting lodged in the pipeline. They're yeah. going to happen at some point. You know what it's like, property and development is cyclical. So when you're in a trough, you know it's going to go in the way up soon. So we just want to kind of be there at the right place. Um, and I'm sure a lot of these developments will, will kick off when the time's right. Yeah, everything is temporary. And what I'm consistently 
um, advising and educating our students with is that whatever the masses are doing, do the opposite. So if everyone's holding back and stepping back and maybe not actually transacting, that's exactly the time where you could be picking up some um, bargains or be a little bit more creative. You maybe just have to dig deep and look, think outside the box, as they say. You do. And, you know, we're seeing that at the moment. I suppose where a lot of people think there's opportunity at the moment is where there's a bit of a distressed housing yeah. market. You know, people aren't able to service their mortgages anymore. Yeah. So we're starting to hear about more of them cropping up. Um, or indeed, on the development side, it's where um, a lot of developers may have started developing something and their costs have kind of spiraled out of control a little bit. And they, they're like, I just want out of this. You know, uh, this isn't going to get me get me um, a, a profitable project. So they exit and there are some um, opportunities out there. I've, I've got a couple in debt right now in exactly that case where somebody's carried out the groundworks and then they're like, well, I've just sunk my profits into this because the profit's been squeezed. So I'm going to put it in the market, get out of it, move on to the next thing. So... Yeah, you just got to, you just got to, as you are, Caroline, you know, you've got to stay in tight with agents, know what's coming up, trying to get a little, a little off-market deal. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so talk us through your um, your sweet spot, if you're like, your, the type of client that you would like to work with, and then we can go and talk about the type of solutions that you can come up with for um, that client. Sure, well, I mean... I suppose you always start with saying, like, listen, we, we, we've got a really wide ranging lending panel so that we can we can deal with up to 30 million pound developments, but also down to 100,000 pounds or less refurbishments, flips, without a doubt. Um, I suppose the, the majority of our good work is done in the kind of one to five million range where there's still been a lot of developments um, at the moment. And, you know, there's still a good flexible lending market out there. So that even if there are little issues, you know, profits being squeezed, you know that if you sit down with a lender that you know well, you can really talk it through, like settle all the risks a little bit to make everyone comfortable going into it. Mm. So we've done, done a good bit of that. Um, and, you know, at Berdalbin, the reason I'm here is because Berdalbin always like to try and add a bit of value to whatever product they're looking at, you know, rather than than kind of churn, churn them through. Um so I've come in to, and I can help people that haven't carried out many developments. You know, I think uh, when you go into the development world, you know, even if you've worked in development, there's a lot of little, um, you know, activities that happen in the background that you maybe miss. So new developers that have maybe done a couple of developments um, in the past, they're now looking to level up. I can sit with them and say, look, that here's how you want to structure things. You need to be able to mitigate all your risks. You need this sort of team. And for you to get the best chance of getting finance, you need to minimize your risks. And this is the way to do it. Um, what kind of um, creative or challenging scenarios have you come across in the last, say, six to 12 months that you've successfully solved for people? Oh, well, they're all a challenge. That's the thing with development. They're all a challenge in some way. Um, I suppose Bredalbin, one of the big selling points of Bredalbin is that we, we've we got um, specialists in a lot of different finance um, finance products. So we do a lot of asset finance, invoice finance, um, a lot of business loans. We do a lot of restructuring and refinance. So where we've done really you know, inventive solutions is where somebody will come with a business and they're trying to develop a couple of houses They've maybe got a funding gap or, you know, something's not stacking up. We can look at their overall business to say, well, listen, how about we, if you've got a fleet of cars, let's refinance them. If you have, you know, can we remortgage? Do you have unencumbered property where we can go and get flexible funding against that? And I suppose we can sit down with the specialist from Bredalbin's team and unpick that for a client. So we can be really inventive in how we approach um any financial problem but I think for property in particular where you know lenders always like the borrower to put in money what they call the heart money you know yeah. so um sometimes you know borrowers don't have that or they struggle to come up with it or they would rather stay liquid and keep it in their pocket so knowing that there's multiple ways to raise money for development 
is a really great tool for a lot of clients. Um, we've done that, I suppose, for, for an example, we've been involved with the development of a few clients of their own properties. Okay. So a couple where they've owned land and they want to develop, say, uh, one of them was a big workshop and showroom because they sell a lot of agricultural equipment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're building something for yourself, you want to make it pucker. You know, you want to give it all the bells and whistles. But, you know, if you put that in the market, you probably wouldn't get the value back from those bells and whistles. So they were needing to raise some additional funding in the background. And what we did is we looked at their machinery. So we were able to get the property and development funding specifically for their building. And then everything else they wanted to put in, we refinanced some of the vehicles so they get money out of that. And it worked out great. And of course, once it's all done, exit on to a mortgage, which I think you've met my colleague James, we've got a specialist in commercial mortgages as well. So we can, uh, can attack it from, from different angles and it, it works great. It works really well. I love that example because actually the, the, you, you approach your own house um, development very differently it's from an investment uh, from, a, from, from a finance point of view because I know that on my own house there was no budget. It was like whatever I want I'm going to get and I don't care how much it costs. Like that's what's happening. But on a project that's a development on a commercial level that you're going to use in a business or whatever then you have to be a lot more stringent with those costs and staying to budget. Okay, so you, you you have multiple hats there then when you're sitting down with a client, looking at their development, you're thinking primarily about getting the funding for it, but you're probably looking with your QS hat thinking, where could this potentially uh, go yeah. out of control cost-wise? Well, well, that's it. And I suppose the key thing that I found, the kind of where I'm finding I add a lot of value is that there can be a little bit of a communication back gap between the finance side people and the construction side people, yeah. which tends to be, you know, um, again, I'll take a bigger bank or a bigger lender as a as an um, example. They'll typically have three parts, which is the first kind of BDM sales side, getting yeah. indicative terms, and then you'll have an underwriter that will work with a, um, a valuer on the development monitor to look into the nuts and bolts of the design and the project. And then you've got the credit committee at the end who you know will look at the bank's risk basically how much are they willing to lend so because there's a mixture of people in there when it comes to development risk is the key thing there's always going to be a range of risks and it's understanding how big that risk is is it something to do with the structure is it planning is it you know the, the exit and being able to fully understand that and you know, translate that, communicate that to the decision makers is what makes the finance go smoothly and become a successful product. Brilliant. So yes. give me some more examples of scenarios that you've had challenges with in the past that you've managed to come up with solutions. I love the example of the, the vehicles um, with the, the no house. I mean, I the, the most simple one is always the first question that a lender asks when somebody comes with the development is what's your experience? Now, this touches on a load of stuff we've discussed before. It's because you know developments have all these risks and it's always experience that trumps um, trumps you know anything else and how you go about that. Um, now, if somebody comes with a bit of development and they've not got any experience, that's the first red flag. Okay. So the way you get around that is, you know, you can start um, consulting with your client to say, Right, you need to do a lot of surveying, for instance. So we've, we've helped put them in touch with people. Um, an example would be some, well, as you know, you, you know, you like the kind of Edinburgh properties, properties like that where you go in, those walls have been standing for 120, 30 years. You don't know what's behind it. Yeah. The only way to mitigate all of those risks is to go in, make sure that you do loads of surveys so that when you do come to look at the finance side, you can put all that on the table and say, look, we know that we're not experienced, but we're hiring a project manager. We've done loads of surveys. We've mitigated our risks. And then a lender will say, OK, this has really been thought about. So we can maybe overlook that this is your first bigger project. So that that's a really simple one. And it's one I see all the time. A lot of developers will go to um, a high street or a challenger bank and immediately be knocked back because they can't prove they've had two or three successful um, projects in the past. 
you know, because we know the wider lending market for development finance, we know who will look at that. And it's always the smaller guys where you can sit down with an underwriter or a decision maker and really explain that to them and show that all these risks have been mitigated. Um, I always say it's like the bigger the lender, they've got this check sheet. And yeah. if you don't take one box, it's like computer says no. It's kind of book closed. Yeah. Whereas with, with the smaller guys, there's a lot of um, a lot of let's look more into this. Does the deal make sense? If it does make sense, there's always a discussion to be had. So that's great. We, we look at it that way. Other like let's think other challenges. Um, the planning we, side of things. We've well, talked about that a little. Because you talked about that. Yeah, I suppose yeah. planning. Uh, th this is more from a QS point of view um, than, a, than a, a finance point of view. But but the planning and building warrant. Now, um, you know, we've had this discussion from a, having been a consultant, the best advice I can give developers of any size is build a team and don't be afraid to spend money. I know it can be difficult. Spend the money up front. Yeah. I've said it before, and I feel like I'm saying risk a thousand times, but it's because it's such a big part of it that yeah. you need to mitigate your risks. You know, if you look at any project, find out what the risks are early and then you've got to deal with them. You've got to either get rid of them, you can mitigate them, or you take them on, but you need to know what they are. So for planning, yeah, if you're if you're developing a few houses in an area where there's hundreds of houses, it's probably not that big of a risk, you know? Whereas yeah. if you're going into a niche city centre site, you're trying to go in, buy a property, change its use, you know, if it's a listed building, you're probably trying to change some... Um, some features that somebody might get upset about. These yeah. are all risks, but the way you mitigate them is getting the right consultants on at the right time. Yeah. Survey, survey, survey. Take a look what's out there. Use planning consultants. Use architects with the right background. And then, of course, as I say, always play in your value on your um, your QS as well, just to make sure that what you're doing for property, A, it's not going to cost too much. You're yeah. always going to get money back. But B, is it worth doing it? You know it's some, I, I've had one project where somebody wanted to take the whole facade off a building and put it back on. You know, it was going to cost just to make it look great. You know, you know, um, he wants it to look like a premium property, but yeah. he, was never, he was never going to recoup that money. And that took, you know, weeks of what are the solutions for doing that, yeah. get it priced, and then say, it's not worth it. You know, yeah. and... It, it's th those challenges come up all the time, all the time. Okay, so this I'm going to be really blunt now because a lot of our listeners will not know the difference between taking a three bedroom terraced house, ripping it back to brick, and building a six bed six bath HMO. Would that be classed as a development? To me, I would be that. That's probably a smallish development. So this I would, is really interesting. Yeah, I would need QS for that, right? And I, I'm not going to get a QS involved. For something like that where is the line kenny from your sure. point of view where is it from heavy refurb to development i would class that as a development i yeah. think right so i've had this conversation a few times and everyone's got a different take on it yeah my take on it after talking to a lot of lenders is when you are changing the value of a security you yeah. have to view that as a development okay and I think you need to be careful about how you purchase these properties and what you're doing to them as well, because if you look at the fine print of a lot of mortgages, they'll probably say as much. If you are doing anything to that building, we want to know about it, because exactly what you're saying there, at some point, you'll have everything gutted, knocked down, and the building will be worth significantly less than when you bought it. So yep. you have to, um, the right way to do it is yep. to get a lender that will go on that journey with you. Now, we've got quite a few. If you're buying properties like that through a business, um, we've got a lot of products out there that will allow light refurbishment, which will you know, mostly be finishes and it needs to be 20 to 25% of the value. Okay. Or you know, medium, which is probably maybe sticking an extension on or a little bit of more structural work. Um, I suppose you could term that as maybe 50% of the cost. Okay. And then once you're getting into full ground up development, if you're gutting something out and you're trying to increase the value by three, four, four fold, then it's, it's full development. Now, 
I would, well, I would still say try and get a core team around you. Um, or listen, if you're experienced and you walk into a property and you're like, I'm 90% sure I know what to do here. Absolutely, yeah. go for it. But if there's any question mark there, you know, it costs, it potentially doesn't cost that much yeah. to get an architect in, a QS in, yeah. double check things. And listen, I suppose there's different views in this. I would rather spend the money on advice, know there was a problem, know there was a solution, and then execute it. Yeah. There's a different train of thought, which is I'm not going to bother spending that money, and if I find a problem, I'll have some money to deal with it. Mm. I suppose it depends on where your risk is. Uh, you know, if you're if you like taking on risk like that, then go for it. Um, but I suppose uh, having been a QS and seen a thousand problems, uh, I would like to get those get those issues um, flushed out as early as possible. Yeah, and I think that is really sound advice because listed buildings and planning and building control, having that team is absolutely essential. So from the lending side of view, um, if let's say someone takes out development finance with you and then does something that was unplanned per se, um, what, what, like for, as an example, let's say that the plan was always to, to convert it into X, Y, Z right and look a certain way and then halfway through the development they change their mind and say actually I'm going to do ABC what does that mean for them um from a lender's point of view what ex you know because you know some so, people are rogue right they go off that rogue level yeah I mean there's two angles to that one if always be careful if you've got planning or building warrant you've got to stick to it if you change it you need to get those changes ratified before doing them if um, if you don't, and sometimes you don't, if you're doing non-structural work, if it's all um, refurbishment and the like, and you change halfway through, from a finance point of view, it's all about how much value are you adding to that property. Yeah. So um, in a very simple terms, you know, you'll start a property will start off here, you'll do work, the value will go up, you'll do more work, the value will go up. And a lender, development lenders, will also will always lend on how much you're adding value. So they need to be aware of that. And the way they do that is through a development monitor. Yeah. So if a development monitor comes, looks at the looks at the project, and they turn up one day and go, "Oh, wait a minute! I thought you were putting on an extension there, and there's a wall now. Yeah. Actually, it's not going to be worth as much once you've finished. So I need to tell the bank that." And the bank will or lender will maybe give a little bit less. Yeah. So yeah, you just need to be careful. And I suppose the only advice I can say is just keep be honest and keep everyone informed. You know, and if you keep everyone informed, the worst that someone can say is don't do that or don't change or we'll give you a bit less. There's normally a way around it. Um, but yeah, keep everyone informed. Yeah. So the 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 worst thing that could happen from a development point of view, in my mind, uh -huh. is running out of money before the development's finished. Is would you agree that that's the worst thing, or is there something worse than that? Oh well, well. <laughs> it's falling uh, down mid. I mean, you know, apart from catastrophic meteors hitting it, or it falling down yeah. mid development. Uh, from a finance hat point of view. For oh, yeah, for, well, listen from from the finance point of view. Um, Every funder wants you to get over the line. That's why they put in a lot of diligence. That's why they have development monitors, underwriters. It's a, it, absolutely they need you to get there because funders don't want to be, um, you know, taking having to take projects in and, and um, dispose of them. So uh, the way that I approach that is that you really need to have a frank conversation and do some sums very early on yeah. how much the equity input needs to be. Yeah. Now, you need to go into a bit of depth to do that. You need to take a look at what are you doing? How much does that cost? When do you need all the money? Yeah. And then you need to ask yourself, what realistically is the bank going to give me through that development or refurbishment? And you need to, it's too easy to turn a blind eye to it. And I think there's a big psychology thing there where people have finance within their grasp and just want to press the button sometimes you need to step back and say actually halfway through this project I'm going to need 
a hundred grand or five hundred grand in my back pocket to get over a funding gap to get yeah. to, to completion. Now, if you look at that early enough, it may be there's a different product out there, or um, someone like myself can look at your wider portfolio and say, actually, I can raise you money against some flats on a second charge bridge that is maybe going to be expensive, but it's going to get you over that that line. Yeah. But flush it out early. So yeah, running out of money, uh, it's not a place anyone wants to be. Yeah. Again, you, you don't want to be in your heels. You don't want to have to go and be, you know, asking around how how do I raise this? But you can you can the best thing to do is just run the sums early doors. Make sure you've got contingency. Uh, again, I know a lot of uh, projects they squeeze the contingency. So, you know, everyone would love to have 10% going into a project, but a lot of times they say, well, I know, I think it's safe. I'm going to go down to five and then they get everyone over the line, but then interest rates go up or, yeah. you know, they find a soft spot in, uh, in the ground where they're putting down foundations, boom, your contingency is wiped out and then yeah, you're, you're sweating. So, yeah, listen, um, making sure you've got enough money is so important and, as I say, because of my background, I, I, I do it a lot with clients to say, let's take a moment to run a cash flow forecast. Let's take a look at what the funder's probably going to give you. Are there funding gaps? And every fund, the funders typically will do things two way. One on a, how much have you spent that month? And they'll fund you that, or they'll do what's called a residual land value calculation, which at any one point, they'll give you a value on your land. And depending on what way they value that, the pinch point will be in a different place. It might be at the start of a project or it might be halfway through a project. Yeah. You have to think it through. Yeah. And I, yeah, I'm very grateful for you to uh, help us out on our current project. I know that I've now got a pot that I can go in and fish from uh -huh. if uh, the, the gap arises on our on one of our current projects. And so I um, highly recommend you sitting down with Kenny and talking through the options because now I can sleep at night knowing that no matter what happens, the project's getting finished, the builder's getting his money, he's not walking off site, I'm not chasing around trying to find somebody new, which you know just literally would kill any profit in, in any deals. So um, thank you, Kenny, for the help that you've given me on that. And that's why you're sitting here right now, because you can massively add value to our community and our students. Anything yeah. anything else apart from get your right, the right team in, um, surrounding you, have a contingency, know the pinch points on, on the lending, um, any other little gold nuggets of advice that you'd give our listeners before we sign off here? A really common one is developers say, your profits made the day you buy the site. You have to run your sums before you buy that site. Yeah. If you buy a site and then at any point you're like, oh, I'm not going to make the profit I thought because I hadn't looked under this store and I hadn't taken a look <laughs> at the sales values. It happens all the time. So I suppose that's just more from the successful people I work with. They do so much diligence before they buy a site, even before they've gone into planning or building warrant. It needs to stack up. So I suppose do your homework, do it at the start. And if you're needing advice, you know, that's just give me a call. I'm happy to talk to anybody at those early doors and point them the right way to, you know, who's in the market that can give them advice they need for any project. I'm more than happy to do that. Brilliant. So how, what's the best way for people to reach out to you if they're potentially looking at a site that they think, oh, I think I can make money from that, but I'm not sure, haven't done one before. How, how what's, How's the best way to get hold of you? Well, we've got a website, uh, bradalbanfinance.co.uk. Um, my email address is kenny at bradalbanfinance.co.uk. Drop me an email. Um, hopefully, I don't know if there's a way I can put my details uh, on here, but yeah, look at the website. We're all on there. We've got our mug shots on. So You'll be able to uh, call any of us. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Kenny, for your time. I know that our listeners will have got a lot of value out of that. The numbers, the numbers, the numbers, contingencies, plan, 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 plan to the nth degree um, and have surveys uh, carried out so that you, you don't get any nasty surprises because uh, we don't want any of that. Well, I'll Absolutely. be speaking to you again very, very soon, Kenny. Thanks for your time today. Great. No, thank you. Thanks, Carly. Take care. Thanks,